Hey there, the Pregnancy Workbook is out in the world. I'm already hearing really positive and great feedback about how the book is helpful to both clinicians and people going through pregnancy anxiety. This workbook really is focused on helping people to manage and cope with anxiety and worry using skills like CBT and mindfulness. Some of the feedback includes how easy the workbook is to use while still having tons of information in there. The skills are there for you to use as needed, but there's a ton of learning in there as well. If you have the book, I would love to have a review from you on Amazon or from wherever you purchase the book online. The more support the book gets, the better it can support other people. Go search for the pregnancy workbook so you can feel heard, understood, validated, and have useful skills to help you throughout your pregnancy. Welcome to Mom and Mind, where we dive into all aspects of perinatal mental health and wellness related to pregnancy, birth, loss, postpartum, and new parenthood. It's so much more than postpartum depression. We raise the volume on all of these topics in the hopes that someday everyone will have the support and info that they deserve before they need it. Please note this podcast is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. We are getting into some really, really important stuff today. Some of you already may know about intrusive thoughts or have heard about them before and wondered what in the world is that anyways. Well, that's what we're talking about today. I am very honored and excited to be talking with Dr. Nicole Fairbrother. She's a registered psychologist and clinical associate professor with the University of British Columbia's Department of Psychiatry in British Columbia, Canada. She's the head of the UBC Perinatal Anxiety Research Lab. Her program of research is in the area of perinatal mental health with a focus on anxiety disorders and epidemiology. And if you've read any book lately or any information on perinatal anxiety or intrusive thoughts specifically, and checked your references, you might have seen her name. She is doing extremely important research on perinatal anxiety and intrusive thoughts specifically. And the reason it's so important, in my opinion, is because we get concrete data that helps us reduce stigma. And to that end, we do talk about some sensitive stuff today. So if you yourself are dealing with intrusive thoughts or feel like you might be feeling a little bit vulnerable right now, just gauge for yourself if you feel that you can listen in at this moment. What I do want to tell you is that we not only just talk about intrusive thoughts, Dr. Fairbrother really gives us information to hold on to that they are not dangerous. They are scary, yes, but not dangerous. Dr. Fairbrother is currently recruiting for a study on intrusive thoughts, and I would highly encourage anyone who is interested to listen into this episode and follow the links to parlab.med.ubc.ca or look on their Facebook, UBC P-A-R-L-A-B, for more information. They're recruiting right now. She's going to give us some more details about who can participate and what that might look like. And oh my gosh, if you love perinatal mental health, if you love research, if you love learning, this episode is 100% for you. At the end of our episode today, I'll also give you some other information about how you can support this research. So without further ado, Dr. Nicole Fairbrother. Welcome, Dr. Fairbrother. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really, really excited to hear what you have to tell us today because intrusive thoughts are such a big topic within the perinatal mental health field. And it seems to me uh, we still don't understand them as clearly as we could. And there's a lot more that we could know. Um, specifically for the people out there who are dealing with them currently, intrusive thoughts can be really scary and um, confusing. So uh, we're going to get into all of that, but I would love for you to tell us about the research that you are doing around anxiety and um, intrusive thoughts specifically. Yeah, so um, I, I'll start in a in a little bit of a, a personal way, which is that when I became pregnant with my first child, my son, who's now 20, I was completing my PhD in psychology, in clinical psychology, working in the area of anxiety disorders. And when I became pregnant, I fell madly in love with reproduction Mm. and childbirth and early parenting and all of that. And I thought, you know, surely there's a way to create a career out of this. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the beginning for me. And, you know, when I had my first child, I experienced some um, unwanted intrusive thoughts of harm Mm. related to my son. And I had 
I think, a very uncommon reaction to that. My reaction was, wow, that's so cool. That's like an obsession in OCD. That's so neat. (laughs) That seems like a researcher response. (laughs) It's a researcher response. But then, you know, my next thought was, what if you didn't know anything about OCD? Mm -hmm. And what if the first time you had a thought like this was in the middle of the night and you're on like two hours of sleep and you're alone with the baby in the dark? Yep. Yeah. And just what does that feel like when nobody has told you about this kind of thinking, these kinds of thoughts? And that was the beginning of me um, starting to initiate research around that and to to figure out, has anyone else done any work on this? What has Mm -hmm. been done and how could we contribute? So we began with a very small study with 100 participants. In that study, we found that 100% of the women in our sample reported unwanted intrusive thoughts of their baby being harmed by accident. So things like, what if I trip carrying the baby down the stairs? Or what if, you know, the baby accidentally falls off the change table, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And a full 40, oh my goodness, I'm not going to remember now, 40, somewhere between 46 and 50% of the sample of our sample of new moms also reported unwanted intrusive thoughts of hurting their baby on purpose. So thoughts that they didn't want to have. And they were really interesting and and varied. Um, In the city where we collected the data, this big seawall around our biggest park, and one of the participants had the thought, what if I just shoved the stroller off the Mm seawall? And other women had thoughts like, what if I just poke my finger through the soft spot on the top of the baby's head? Mm -hmm. And so we also, in that study, had a little look at, is there any relationship between having these really scary thoughts and hurting your baby? We, we didn't think there would be, mm-hmm. but we also knew that when new moms talk about these kinds of thoughts, people get really, really worked up. Right, right. And the immediate assumption is that they are predictive of child abuse and people mm-hmm. often respond accordingly Mm-hmm. And if that's true, obviously that's necessary. But if it's not true, it's really damaging. Uh, yeah. And so that was our first kind of attempt to answer that question. But, you know, we only had 100 people. We found no relationship with harming behaviors, mm-hmm. FYI. But it was a small sample. So um, I don't want to hijack our whole conversation by giving you a very long speech on the two subsequent studies, but we have since, (laughs) you can let me know how much of that you want to know, but we have since conducted one much larger study and are in the process of a third. Looking at uh, similar things or uh, expanding it to include other stuff as well? So we're, we are including other things, but the we really felt like that core question of is there a relationship with harming behaviors needed to be explored far enough that we could answer that question really clearly in ways that would not leave a lot of room for doubt. Oh, perfect. Right? Yeah. And so um, we are in the midst of publishing from the first paper where, again, we found the same proportion of people, 50% of our sample reported thoughts, unwanted intrusive thoughts of hurting their baby on purpose. 100% of the sample reported unwanted intrusive thoughts of accidentally harming their baby. And again, um, it, it looks like there's probably not a relationship with harming behaviors. So we have since, we're since replicating that in a sample of two to 3,000 women To be 100% sure so that when we provide prenatal education around harm thoughts, Mm -hmm. we can speak to that question definitively. Oh, I'm really, that that is the current study? Yeah. So the third, the second one is in the midst of being published. Mm -hmm. The third one is going to be um, published. uh, The third one is in process where we're in the process of data collection. The other thing we're doing that I think people listening would probably be quite excited to learn about. We we want a little bit of money to make, I'm so excited about this, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit of money to make an animated educational video mm-hmm. about postpartum harm thoughts and their relationship with obsessive compulsive disorder oh, and great. parenting. So within the next 12 months, we will have a really cute 
animated video educating everybody, you know, maternity mm -hmm. care providers, new parents, mm -hmm. pregnant people about these kinds of thoughts. And we will also have a really nice infographic Great. providing the same content. So that's something I'll make sure that when we have that, that I, I, I send you copies of these things because that I think will be the beginning of us being able to really educate people about these kinds of thoughts. Oh, I will absolutely put it everywhere. I think it's so, so, so important. And I mean, the work you're doing is diving into the, like the direct stigma that has has been been perpetuated, I think, too, uh, around these thoughts and, you know, harm. And that some, I mean, there's always, right, I think perinatal mental health issues in general have been like discounted or associated with some kind of harm. You'll hear people say, well, I don't feel like hurting my kids, so there's nothing wrong with me or something like that. And oh, it, wow. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's really sad. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it really is. So I, I think this is going to be really vital in, in kind of crushing that stigma. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think that's probably compounded as well by the fact that when new moms experience these kinds of thoughts, they're already worried. What if this means I'm a danger to my child? Absolutely. So if their care provider is responding as if that's the only possible answer, I think new moms are really set up to go, yeah, I'm scared about that too, right? Mm -hmm. So there oh, isn't sure. going to be, it's, gonna, it's really hard without there being more education for the people mm -hmm. experiencing these kinds of thoughts to push back and say, hey, no, I don't think I'm at risk of hurting my child. Right. Yeah, I mean, even for me as a, I was already a, you know, professional psychologist and whatnot went after I had my daughter and um, experiencing intrusive thoughts um, of a sexual nature for the first time ever. It was terrifying. There was, I did not want to tell anybody about it because it made me question myself. It made me wonder, oh gosh, ha had anything happened to me and why am I thinking like this? Yeah. Um, and that can be terrifying for new parents. Absolutely. Yes, it can be really scary. And I think, you know, one of the things that we that we often um, discount or maybe don't think about is that for many, many people, if, you know, for many moms, if you have a daughter, you know, it may be the first time in your life that you've had that kind of intimate contact with another female body in that way. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't surprising that it can trigger some intrusive thoughts because it is a really novel situation that is really unfamiliar to mm -hmm. us. Right. Yeah. And I, I've read in some of the literature that you don't necessarily yourself have to have had a sexual trauma history and for the sexual intrusive thoughts to occur. Um, Absolutely not. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. It is. I mean, that could obviously be a, a, a trigger for those kinds of thoughts, but it is really true that these are such, they're such a normal part of being a human being mm -hmm. and that we produce all kinds of, of internal ideation where we will never know why did I dream that I was sharing ice cream cones with a whole group of Boy Scout teddy bears. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you will never, you will never yeah. be able to answer that question. And a lot of these thoughts, they're kind of like that. You shrug your shoulders and you think, wow, that was weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. And and that is like ideal if we can get to a place where we can just shrug it off and know that our brain does funny things like that. Um, Absolutely. But, but um, to your point earlier, like it, it's very distressing um, to... Uh, to experience them for the for the first time in relation to your own child who, you know, because this is all new, the baby's new, mother motherhood, parenthood is new, it feels even that much more scary because it's in relation to this vulnerable new little thing. Yeah. So one of the ways with my therapy clients that I really try to reframe that is we talk about evolution. And how we have evolved to care for our newborn babies. And I'll often ask therapy clients, you know, if you have a thought like, ooh, that balcony is really high. What if I drop the baby? You're going to take a step back. Mm -hmm. 
And most of us don't feel frightened by those thoughts. We think, oh, good, I had a thought that, you know, that was dangerous and I needed to be more careful. And so I took a step back. Mm-hmm. If you have the thought, what if I throw the baby over the balcony? Mm-hmm. That's a whole different emotional response. But the right. truth is, the truth is that behaviorally, you take a step back, you might even take two. And evolution doesn't mm-hmm. care that that made you really uncomfortable. Mm. From an evolutionary point of view, both kinds of thoughts, these thoughts of what if what if something happens by accident and I could have prevented it? Or what if I do something on purpose? Both kinds of thoughts are responded to by most parents with increased vigilance to threat, mm-hmm. increased protectiveness of our infants. So in many ways, these kinds of thoughts are part of being a good parent. Mm-hmm. Oop, there you go. Um, I hope people can really hear that um, because it, the reality is, is that, yes, if you're looking at it objectively, you can see the parents sort of taking a couple of steps back. Um, and internally, they are usually, especially in, with sleep deprivation and what whatever else on board, they are usually feeling in, like guilt and shame for having the the thing. But what you're saying is that the behaviors that they engage in to protect their child are very different from the emotional response. Well, absolutely. And then in, in a certain way, you know, obviously there are risk factors for child abuse, but unwanted intrusive thoughts about hurting your baby on purpose is not one of them. Mm-hmm. And having those thoughts is adaptive. It actually makes you a better parent mm. because you do tend to then think about, oh, that could be dangerous. Oh, that, that what a horrible thought. Oh, I'm going to be careful. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, it may very well be that, you know, evolution has set us up to have this unpleasant experience because we respond to it in a way that is protective. Right. Um, that's extremely helpful, I think, for a lot of people out there listening to just normalize that that yeah. this happens. And especially the statistic you gave us about 100% of people are having these intrusive thoughts of something happening on accident. That's well, everybody. This is every single mom. Yeah. Yeah, this right. And I think the other thing, too, is that from the field of obsessive compulsive disorder, we know that we typically experience unwanted intrusive thoughts in situations where we feel highly responsible for someone or something that is both really precious and really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not hogging too much of our airtime, can I tell you a little story? Oh, I'd love to hear. Okay. So when my kids were little, We had a a woman who nannied for us for a little while, and her parents, she was Jewish, and her parents had escaped Europe during the Second World War. And they were only able to bring two objects of kind of sentimental and monetary value with them from Europe. And it was two champagne glasses that had been in the family for a long time. Mm -hmm. So our nanny was going to get married. And she and her fiance were, the plan was at the end of the ceremony, they were to in front of everyone in attendance to toast each other with these precious champagne glasses. Do you have any thoughts going through your mind right now? Me? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think when I tell you that? I'm worried they're going to break. <laughs> That's right. That is exactly right. So I want to show you how those wine glasses are so much like our newborn baby. Yes. Those wine glasses were vulnerable because they're made of crystal and they're very fragile. Right. Like a newborn. Right. They were precious because they had deep meaning for this family. Mm-hmm. And this couple were in a position of high responsibility because it was their job to keep those wine glasses safe. Right. And that's exactly the same with the newborn baby. Oh, you are good, Dr. Fairbrother. That was <laughs> that was well, fantastic. I, I, really, it was my nanny who, who she told me this story. And I, I have used, I, I, I wish that I could remember her name to give her credit because mm-hmm. I've used this story so many times because I think it just, everybody says, oh, no, don't break uh, yeah. glasses. Oh, right, right. Ah, but it's it's such a good example and another way of normalizing how these thoughts come to be. We want to protect yeah. things that are precious and valuable. 
Yet nobody, nobody has unwanted intrusive thoughts that upset them about, you know, shoving Arnold Schwarzenegger in the grocery store. People don't have these <laughs> kinds of thoughts, or if they do, they don't they don't get on their radar when we have right. them about people who right. are not vulnerable at all to harm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just got a full visual of that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, so uh, speaking of then, uh, in, in terms of OCD, the intrusive thoughts that are related to OCD, um, what do you see? I mean, I, I assume you're, you're describing a couple of different things. One is just intrusive thoughts. People have it. You don't necessarily have a diagnosis of anxiety. Uh, then there are people who are having intrusive thoughts with anxiety. And then there's people who are having intrusive thoughts with OCD. Is that yeah, correct? So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I would say actually is that it would be, it would be very unusual for someone to be experiencing unwanted intrusive thoughts in the postpartum period and that their anxiety not be in the direction of obsessive compulsive disorder, whether or not they um, met criteria for that disorder. Mm-hmm. What is very possible is for someone to have these unwanted intrusive thoughts of infant-related harm and to not have any OCD at all. The thoughts themselves are a completely normative human experience. Mm. The thing that tends to move a person from the experience of the thoughts into OCD is if they interpret the fact that they're having the thoughts to mean something terrible. Right. So when they have the thoughts, what we notice in our research is that some women have these thoughts and they go, oh, that was odd. Must be tired. And that's it. That's Mm -hmm. the only that's the only processing of it they do. They just kind of shrug. Mm -hmm. And those are not people vulnerable to OCD. People Mm -hmm. are vulnerable to OCD if they have the thought and they think, oh, my God, what's wrong with me that I'm having this thought? It must mean that I'm a danger to my child. I'm a bad person, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And if that snowballs. It will mm-hmm. snowball into OCD. Right. And that the thoughts themselves are not a symptom of OCD. They're just a normal part of being a parent. Mm-hmm. And it is the interpretation of them and the response to them that can be problematic. And that's why it's so important that we be able to talk about the relationship with actual harming behavior, which we at this point think is none, mm-hmm. um, because we need to be able to say to women having these thoughts, you know what? No, they do not mean that you're dangerous because that's how we prevent OCD. Oh, right. Um, sure. So if if we can help them know that they don't need to do the uh, compulsive behaviors that are trying to prevent the obsession about intrusive thoughts or, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because people can get caught up into... Um, you know, especially if, if someone is vulnerable to OCD, they can get caught up in things like, well, you know, I need to count to 10 in a perfect fashion to make sure that the fact that I thought this doesn't then increase the likelihood that it occurs. So some for some people, that that's in a very kind of magical thinking kind of a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, for some people, it's in a more um, practical way. You know, if I'm having thoughts about... Um, I don't know, unwanted intrusive thoughts about stabbing the baby with the kitchen knife. I never, ever cook with the baby in the room. I always make sure that my partner cares for the baby or he always does all the cooking or, you know, they'll do some avoidance things for sure. Mm-hmm. Have you found that, that there's any one particular behavior such as avoidance that stands out as um, most commonly used? Um I would say that if we, you know, if I step away from intrusive thoughts, OCD, you know, if I step away from this whole conversation, I would say to you, do you know any new parent who does not check on their baby? Right. (laughs) Are you breathing? Are you okay? Are you still there? Are you okay? Are you breathing? What are you doing at night? I should go look at you. Right. Yeah. And that, that would be me too. That would be me included. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, sure. So checking uh, and and rechecking, not necessarily in, in an obsessive compulsive way, but just in a new parent vigilance way. Absolutely. And that is one of the tricky things with new parents sometimes to figure out when these things cross the line mm-hmm. yeah. into something that's enough of a problem that people should push back on it. Because some amount of anxiety about our children's safety and 
hypervigilance to that safety is adaptive and normal and healthy. And we just have to be careful when it gets too big. Um, um, Yeah, absolutely. If you are a person just like me who's gone through a perinatal mental health condition, you know how isolating and lonely it can be. You might also have realized how few people really truly understand what's going on, and that can sometimes include family, friends, medical providers, everybody. Postpartum Support International is working very hard to make sure that every single person knows and understands perinatal mental health conditions. In an effort in this direction, they host the world's largest event for perinatal mental health awareness called Climb Out of the Darkness. Every year, people in small and large communities gather all over the world to come together with a community of people who really, really understand what's going on, other people who've been through it. What's really fantastic about this event is that you can participate if you've been feeling the call to join other people who really understand what you're going through and who've also been through it themselves. Find a local climb in your area. And if there isn't a climb, you can actually start one. It's pretty easy to do, and PSI and the Climb Out of the Darkness team have streamlined everything so that whether you're hosting a small walk around the park or a huge climb through some actual mountains, you can be part of this growing community. To find out more, go to climboutofthedarkness.com or email cotd at postpartum.net. Find a climb, lead a climb, sponsor a climb, or even climb right from your couch. Or you can even do a virtual climb right from your house. All of the funds raised go back to PSI, PSI chapters, and local organizations doing work on the ground to help raise awareness and let everyone know who's gone through these conditions that you are not alone. What can you tell us about how common perinatal OCD is and and what you've seen in the research? Yeah, that's, um, in some ways, that's that's an adventurous question right now. The study that we just completed involved, I think, maybe 350 women at three time points, once in pregnancy, at the end of pregnancy, and then twice in the postpartum. And that allowed us to estimate how common is perinatal OCD Mm -hmm. and how often do women develop OCD in the early postpartum period. And Everyone up until us had said about 2%, mm-hmm. more than would normally be the case in general, but, but around 2%, and that it was a little more in the postpartum. And we asked the same question, although we did it in a slightly different way. So the two things that we did differently is that we very explicitly asked participants about their perinatal harm thoughts related to their infant. Mm-hmm. And as part of the OCD assessment. And we also use DSM-5 criteria, which is looser Mm -hmm. than the previous diagnostic criteria in version four. Mm -hmm. So there was a loosening of diagnostic criteria that I'm confident has had some impact on our findings. But we, I believe, saw about 8% in the prenatal period and 16 point something percent in the postpartum period. Wow. So, yeah. So it's really, really common. And just to, to, for for your listeners to understand what it means to to be in that category of people who form the 16% to get there, your OCD needs to either take two hours a day or more, or cause you significant emotional distress Mm -hmm. or significantly impair your functioning in your day-to-day life. So it's not a low bar, right? right. That those symptoms have to be really super time consuming or clinically distressing or impairing, which is, you know, saying quite a bit. So 16% of our sample. The other thing that was interesting is that for women who did not have OCD in the prenatal period, there was a 9% risk of developing OCD in the postpartum period Mm. uh, up in the first six months. So if you're a new mom and you've never had OCD, there's a 9% risk that you would develop OCD in the postpartum period. All of this is very interesting, but you said the first six months and for developing postpartum uh, OCD. So I, I think yes. that's an important um, uh, an important thing to note for people who are listening, because I do, I do still think there's a lot of misconception that things, if you're going to have anything like this, it starts sort of right away or in the first three months. But right. But that's not what you're saying. 
Well, you know, I, for me, for me to get the, the really tiny details on this, I probably have to actually go back and read my own paper. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so I think the thing that is really interesting with OCD is that, you know, because it starts with these intrusive thoughts that are normal, and then in order for it to become a problem, it really requires that the person have a response to the thoughts that is a bit problematic. Mm -hmm. And so that can kind of build over time. For sure. Right. So you start doing just a little more checking and then you do a little Mm -hmm. more protective measures and a bit more of of the avoidance and and you push the thoughts away a little harder. So you're actually Mm -hmm. increasing your OCD through those activities. Yeah. So it can take some time for that to build up to a level where it would meet criteria for a diagnosable mental health condition. And so if we're able to catch people sooner and provide Mm -hmm. education about, you know, be calm in the face of these thoughts and don't do these things about them, it could maybe offset that. Fantastic. So it it sounds like there are quite a few things we can do to help prevent this and and to help people through it. And one, a couple of you, you've already said is, is the information that these are normal common rather um, thoughts. Uh, what else can we be doing about in order to help people with, with these difficult thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I personally think that, you know, the most important thing we can be doing is providing prenatal education about them mm-hmm. so that people understand that they're normal, that they're really, they're really unpleasant. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you make a mistake and you flip through a magazine and there's some kind of weird medical photograph and you think oh did I need to see that right Right. and and the ideally this is how we respond to these postpartum thoughts right is that we that we recognize that they are very unpleasant and that they're also a normative postpartum experience and unless they're accompanied by real risk factors for child abuse they're not threatening and I think ensuring that women have that information and both parents, male and female parents, have that information prenatally is going to be the most helpful thing. Yeah. Um, my research group is also in the planning stages for developing um, a cognitive behavioral treatment for mm. perinatal OCD. Ooh. Well, I know. I'm really excited. So I'm working with the woman, Fiona Chalicombe, uh, Dr. Fiona Chalicombe in the UK, who has pilot tested this treatment in face-to-face treatment. And we are developing the treatment as a online therapy. So a kind of self-help therapy. But when Mm -hmm. we test it, we'll be testing it with small amounts of therapist support. So the idea is that when, if it's successful, Mm -hmm. the therapy itself will be posted as a website that anyone can use. Oh my gosh. I love that. Thank you. And oh, then so good. with the idea that you, for example, could have your clients work through the online therapy, but you would be providing that additional support to help them with the various modules because some of them are more complex. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Well, thank you very much. That's true. <laughs> so I have to tell you it is some kind of a deal to plan an right. internet-based treatment. We're, yeah. we're, we're discovering it's a lot of work, but we're really excited about it. <laughs> It's going to be able to reach so many people this way. That was what we really wanted. We wanted to figure out a way that we could design something Mm -hmm. that frankly could be easily translated into other languages. People could just take it and go. Yeah. (laughs) Can't wait. How far out will that be? Uh, How long is that going to take? Oh, you know, you should. should, that is, that's a very dangerous question to ask. (laughs) We are Mm -hmm. hoping to submit our first funding application to do mm-hmm. this and to develop the first treatment module in the next six months. Oh, really exciting. Yeah, thank really, you so really much. Exciting. Thank you. Oh me, my gosh. Yeah, me too. I think it's really necessary. And unlike other some other kinds of anxiety, what we do to help people with OCD is very specific. Mm-hmm. And it would be tricky to really help someone overcome OCD with some of the more just generic anxiety interventions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. You are working on things, not only that just help, you know, in terms of research and furthering our our understanding of this globally, but really impactful, tangible stuff that is 
I mean, we need both. We need all of it. And I just love hearing about what you're doing. It does feel very, I have found it to be really, it's really been good for me emotionally to be engaged in some projects like our video project, where there's a real kind of translation Mm -hmm. of our research into products that can reach people and, and have a direct impact on individuals. That has felt really meaningful to me. I'm really grateful that we have the opportunity to do that. That is great. And the, the research that you're doing, you mentioned you have an ongoing study. Is that something that people can participate in? Absolutely. So at this time, participation, I'm going to warn you, it's actually quite a long, it's a little bit of a long survey. <laughs> and so we're actually just in the process of adding a little incentive to make it just a little more palatable to people to get all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and that should be up and ready within a week. And we have it open to participants in all of the major English language countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So that would, so that's, you know, Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Ooh, fantastic. This podcast has listeners in all of those areas. So I would love to be able to help people find your study. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to put a link in our show notes and also make a couple of social media posts with the, the links in it specifically so people who want to participate can do that. That's really kind. I appreciate it. Um, can you give me just a brief sense of like your ideal participant or participants you're looking for? So this is a study of um, postpartum people, so people who have recently given birth, and right now, I think it might be up to three months postpartum. Mm -hmm. If you, if your listeners were to check out our website, there's a place in the website that says, you know, participate in research, mm -hmm. and you would find it there. It's the postpartum harm thought study, mm -hmm. and the questions involve, you know, lots of questions about OCD and postpartum harm thoughts, as well as some other content areas like sleep and attachment and things like that. Okay, fantastic. So right now we are in May of 2021. How long are you going to be able, or how long are you, is this going to be open for? Oh, it's going to be open for quite a while because we're hoping to recruit 3,000 people. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. So, so, so it would be lovely. We, we, we absolutely need people for the research and it's okay if it takes you a couple of days to decide to participate. <laughs> sure. 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 Okay. So this, this will be open. This, this will be the better of a, a year or how, I, I don't would know, say how at it. least a year. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, great. So I'm thinking of whoever might be listening to this, you know, a couple of months from now or whatever. So that's fantastic. I will leave those links for everybody to find and, and be sure to, to tell everyone about it. That's really um, fine. Thank you so much. Yeah. So just in closing for today, I would love to hear from you just briefly what you've seen in terms of people healing through this and, and kind of getting better, so to speak, from uh, intrusive thoughts and OCD. Yeah, so I would just start by saying that I I think that recovering from this is absolutely within reach for anyone who is having a struggle with these kinds of thoughts. I've had some, you know, sometimes as a scientist, you know, I, I sit behind a computer looking at data files, you know, mm -hmm. and and sometimes I think, wow, does, you know, does this work really matter? And I've had... You know, I've had on occasion people out of the blue colleagues reach out to me and say, you know, I read about your research and it really changed my experience with mm -hmm. my daughter. I was really struggling and I read about what you were doing and it really made a big difference to me. And so I feel like when people, you know, I've had people burst into tears when I tell them that these thoughts are normal. Mm -hmm. I will share my own postpartum intrusive thoughts mm -hmm. with people and see their face change when they realize that they're not alone. Right. Yeah. So powerful. It is, it is absolutely powerful. I appreciate you so much for the work that you're doing. I used some of your research in the book that I just wrote. And I am so exciting. I'm so excited <laughs> to read your book. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm good. just is so thankful for the work that you're doing and how you're furthering the field and reducing stigma. And just these are huge contributions. And I appreciate you for coming on and sharing your time with us today. It was so much fun. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much.
Thank you. All right. I don't know about you guys, but I am fully geeked out, nerded out, whatever out about this episode. And I'm so excited to bring this to you. It's it's crucial that we're learning about this and that research is bearing out what we know in the field. But I just in terms of being able to have research and use research as leverage in the world to be able to say, no, actually, you've got it all wrong, you know, to the people who have misconceptions about intrusive thoughts and perinatal mental health. We have concrete data coming out that just fully supports the work that we're doing. All right, so this research is absolutely crucial. As we stated, you can participate in this. Go to parlab.med.ubc.ca, and I'll have this information in the show notes as well, and find out how you can participate. You can also email parlab at ubc.ca to get connected with their team. And in addition to that, if you yourself are outside of the window of possibility of participating in this study, but you believe in this work, please contribute to this work. They are right now raising funds to help support this research. I will put this link out for you as well. Go to consano.org slash projects slash postpartum harm thoughts, obsessive compulsive disorder, infant safety. That is their fundraising page. I'm going to go there myself right now and put in a donation because I believe this is absolutely critical that we get this information out there. It's just one more evidence-based way that, you know, systems, medical systems, insurance companies, whoever will listen to because we have research to back it up. All right, we'll be posting for a couple of weeks on this episode. So come find us on social media at Mom and Mind on Instagram, Mom and Mind Podcast on Facebook. And as usual, please do share this episode, share our social media posts. We have to get the word out about this. You out there can help us raise the volume on all of this so that, you know, people out there can know that they are not alone. I really thank you for being with us today. Until next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please share this podcast. Together we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Come connect with us at momandmind.com. 